Welcome to Politics and Tactics. Today, we have a great show for you. I'm going to let my co-host, Dave Polykoff, introduce our great guest. Dave? So tonight, like Frank said, we do have a really good show. Um, I've got uh, well, we've, on the show, we've got uh, Eric Bernard. He's the president of, of uh, Rockville Fire Station Number 3 in Montgomery County, Maryland, one of the busiest companies in uh, Montgomery County, as well as uh, probably one of the busiest ones, at least in, in the uh, Washington metro area. And um, we also have uh, had the pleasure of having uh, someone who I've known for quite a while, Tony Tricarico. Tony is a, a retired New York City fireman. Um, uh, was assigned to special ops right before he retired. 252, if I remember correctly, the squad. Yes, and, sir. Uh, like the license plate that uh, yeah. Eric has hanging up in the background. I didn't. There I you go. Before. And then, um, and then uh, he uh, recently moved to Maryland. I say recently, a couple of years ago, to be closer to his family. And uh, he's out on on the island, the Ken Island. And uh, with that being said, uh, Eric, why don't you go ahead and start introduce yourself a little bit more and tell the people about you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I'm living here in Montgomery County, Maryland, where I volunteer for 36 years now. I grew up in Pittsburgh, started volunteering at 15 in a small little area, only did EMS at the time, right outside of the city. I went into the military, served in the Navy, was a combat medic, um, went to the Uniformed Services University, and then I'm a product of the University of Maryland and George Washington uh, University also. And uh, been volunteering since I moved here in the Navy in 1987 at Rockville. The last 20 years, I've been the president there. So we're a combination system in Montgomery County. We work side by side with the women and men that are career in Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. 38 workstations, four of which are the Rockville Volunteer Fire Department. Our volunteers predominantly uh, volunteer at one station. And then for a living, uh, I work for the Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association in our county. Um, that I've well, been- you do the same thing as Dave, so you guys are paid volunteers. <laughs> oh my God! You nailed it, Frank. <laughs> I, I actually am the one paid volunteer in the county. <laughs> yes, yes. So it worked out into a nice career 18 years ago. And what's unique about Montgomery County, and has not been duplicated anywhere in the country or world, is that when they created my position and created one fire chief in charge of career and volunteer, we got collective bargaining rights. So we work, operate, and act very similar to any other union in that we have collective bargaining rights. And since 2004, we have negotiated seven contracts, one addendum during COVID where we were able to extend some additional benefits for our volunteers. Part-time, I teach at GW also, since I went to school there, teach forensic science, forensic pathology, keep me in my uh, profession where I was before I took this uh, paid position. Uh, so that's my life, and I'm glad to be okay, here. Okay, but you didn't tell the best part. Eric, oh, I've known Frank in a firehouse when I a- lived in a firehouse in 1992, and I yes. got to say this as a compliment, he still looks the same as he did in 1992 <laughs> when I lived in the firehouse. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. And Tony, I gave you a little bit of introduction, but uh, go into a little more details about uh, your firefighting career and what you've been up to. Okay. Um, I got in a fire service in 1977 after I came out of the military uh, on, a, on a lock, believe it or not. I, I, didn't, I didn't have firemen with that on my radar, not at all. And uh, when I came out of the military, a friend of mine showed up at my house. He's like, hey, why don't you become a volunteer fireman? I'm like, eh. wasn't really interested in it. I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so... Um, I end up going down there and, and taking a look at it, and they tell me they got a waiting list. So two days later, it did, and my father says, so you want to be a volunteer fireman? My father knew everybody. And uh, I says, well, I'm thinking about it, but they got a waiting list. He says, well, I know somebody if you want me to talk to him. I says, yeah, go for it, Dad. So he, next thing I know, I got a phone call. I went to the trustees, January 7, 77, I become a volunteer fireman. Being a military guy, when you say, don't touch nothing until I tell you, I don't touch nothing unless you tell me. At, at least that's the frame of mind they had at that age and fresh out of the military. Well, the first fire I go to, they tell me to hit the hydrant. In fact, the only, maybe the only thing I knew how to do at the time. It was uh, I got in there in January. Now it's the end of January. I get a fire. And it was cold and it was wet. And I was like, this sucks. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And uh, I kept with it for a while. February, right down two blocks from my house, two young kids died. I, I watched that. The captain was like, listen, it's, you're going to see this stuff. So you to kind of suck it up. And uh, the end of February, I catch my first fire. A guy bangs on the used to bang on a window, boom, boom, boom. We're going to that fire. He says, you know how to use that breathing apparatus? And um, 
I says, yeah. He says, well, I'm going to that. So I would put it on. And so we get there and it's just, it's a basement fire. And it's just me and him on a line and another guy sitting in the front seat. And he says, put your head up my butt. Not as nice as that. Put your head up my butt and don't take it out till I tell you. We went down there, put the fire out. I came back upstairs and I was like, yeah, man, this is what I'm talking about. I love this stuff. And the hook was sunk. I, that was it. Fast forward, seven months later, I walk into the Brentwood Fire Department and they're sitting in the main meeting room and they were all filling out paperwork. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? You're not using crayons. And they're like, oh, we got an application for New York City Fire Department. And at the time, I don't know, it was maybe $30, $40, something like that. And uh, I was making $90 a week. It was 1977. And I was like, come on, I'm not going here. And they were like, come on, you cheap bugger. And they, they kept on me. I ended up filing for it. And next thing I know, I'm a fireman. Best thing that ever happened to me, turned my life around. I can't tell you how good it was. So I became a volunteer. Then I came, became a city guy. I went to 42 Engine, busy, busy shop. I had six fires, my first night tour. My very first fire, my very first fire, I'm going into a, a six-story multiple dwelling. I'm going up four flights of stairs, right? The fire's on the fourth floor, six-story multiple dwelling, vacant building. I get just what the job told me to do. Put my hose down, take my helmet off, put my knee on it, take my helmet off, stop, put my face on it. this old guy behind me. He's 20 years on a job, 21, uh, 42 years old, right? He's not an old guy. Not to me anyway, nowadays, right? <laughs> he says, what the heck? He, as I'm turning around, he says, I'm putting my – smack he smacks the thing right off my face he says take it off i'll tell you when you need it i go down and put the fire out the knots are going the eyes are going i'm choking it was it was a piece of work he says to me later he says let me tell you something kid when you need that mask when you really need that mask you're gonna hope wish that you saved it he says you don't use your air until you really need it you save your air and that's how i was born into the fire service by crazy people like that um Four years there, went to 19 trucks, still in the South Bronx, only seven more blocks south from 175th and Mon Road on 167th Wash. And uh, 50 engine, 19 truck. I went there. Great, great nine years there. And I got promoted in about 14 years. Went to Manhattan for a year, which was a blast. Uh, I, I, could, I could go on and on about all of that stuff, but I'll be, keep it brief if I can. Uh, end up in 157 truck in Flatbush, where I was actually the last place I lived in Brooklyn. I didn't even know there was a firehouse back there. Back then, it was a camp. And... Uh, with another busy, busy firehouse. I was getting work left and right so much. You've got, you know the name Warren Fuchs, the voice of Brooklyn, dispatcher 120 Brooklyn? He actually calls me up. I'm there maybe my fourth tour, third, fourth, fifth tour. He calls me up and says, Lieutenant, where are you working again? And I told him, he says, I'm, okay, good, I'm going to come ride with you. He, I didn't, he didn't ask me, he told me I was riding. And we became fast friends. Warren was a great guy, and I was just kicking butt. I was, getting, I was so hot those first three months. Fast forward, 9-11 happens, and um, I get promoted captain. And I end up in the Special Operations Command in 252. I never looked back. And if I didn't get hurt, I would stay on a job till – well, they kicked me off anyway because I was hurt. But I would stay on a job till they kicked me off because of my age. Loved it. Very impressive career. Oh. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I yeah. loved it. I, I stood as day. I, I just think about it and I light up. I was with those guys this past weekend. At a, uh, the 25th anniversary was this past weekend of the forming of the squad. What a blast. What a blast. And you know the best part about that? Guys thanking me for keeping them, thanking me for bringing them over, thanking me for the training. You, you can't ask for more than that. I still have to question your judgment, though. You went from a high-tax state to an almost as high-tax state. A, a, a high-class what? A high-tax <laughs> state to an almost as high of a tax <laughs> state. And Maryland seems to be going in the wrong direction lately. Just well, I happen to agree with you on that, but I'm here for family, number one. Number two, I like the pace. I'm on the Eastern Shore, and the pace is way different than where I came from. You know, New York vibrates like this. Maryland kind of does this. And I know she eats macaroni and cheese with everything. <laughs> and Old Bay. Yeah, yeah, macaroni and cheese is a big thing around here. There's there's nothing like family. There's no place like home. And that's really why we live where we live. But we must do a better job. And on the on the politics of this, just because we were talking about taxes, that was very interesting, is I'm seeing more and more career fire departments, career unions advocating for broad tax increases. Uh, Modesto, California did a ballot initiative where it was an actual tax increase that wouldn't only help them get their dispatch center, but it would help pave sidewalks. And that, I think, is just a dangerous precedent. And we see now that the unions across the board are advocating for a wealth tax. And it's kind of interesting. Norway, which is a nice little microcosm of a country, they just instituted a wealth tax and they predicted it was going to bring in $150 million a year for 
social services. And it turns out they brought in about $147 million annually a year. But because the wealthy migrated and they had more people migrate out of Norway within one year than the past 13 years, they ended up losing $564 million a year in revenue. And so that's what all- socialism will get you. When, you. when you vote like that, it's just bad, just bad thought process, bad news. You can't vote like that. Right? Well, the but, thing that I see too, Tony, and I'm curious about both of your things is if the, the one thing about the fire department is it always should be an issue advocate. It should always advocate for our service and it should really transcend politics. Yes. It's one thing if yes. you're advocating that you want to get a dispatch center or you want to get new SCBA or new equipment. But once you jump into that political arena where you're advocating for just broad based tax taxes, you're really putting people that would normally support you on the opposite side of you, where I think that our message as firefighters really transcends politics and always advocate for your service, but we shouldn't be the political arm of any political party. That goes for the Democrats. 100%, I agree with you. We should not be putting our nose where it doesn't belong. Our noses should be taking care of our people, taking care of our job, getting the proper equipment. That's where our nose should be, not in the business of voting what other people should do with their money. Right. Not at all. And that wealth tax, that doesn't work because the wealthy will move away. Look what's happening in New York. You know how many people moved out of New York? It's ridiculous. You would get actually when I moved out, I actually bought this house in 2016. I moved out in 2020, bought my wife down here for uh, bought my wife down here because of COVID. Anyhow, you got a surcharge if you took a, a, a trailer from New York and didn't bring it back. So I was paying less money to rent the trailer in Maryland, bring it up to New York, keep it for a week and bring it back here than I would have for one trip on a trailer out of New York because everybody was taking everything and leaving. That, and here you would have supported a local business that pays taxes in New York if you could take it one way. It's right. unintended consequences. Eric, mm-hmm. you said something very interesting and then I'll pass it off to Dave for a question. Is you said that the volunteers <laughs> have a collective bargaining agreement. So normally across the country, you'd have the president of a volunteer organization or the chief advocating for the needs um, the budget requirements and things of that nature. So do you, is it separate? Is it still in a sense management of the volunteers advocating for the collective bargaining agreement? Or do we have another layer of bu- bureaucracy where we have you as the president, the fire chief advocating for one thing, and then you have this volunteer collective bargaining, I don't know what you call it, advocating for another, or is it just one entity? It's one entity, Chief. Uh, What we first had to successfully do back in 04 is come under one voice, one umbrella. um, And that took years. And that includes our recruitment and retention. So uh, we advocate on everything from taxes. Uh, You guys brought that up. I'm going to tell you, Maryland stepped up and passed enabling legislation five years ago to allow a $2,500 property tax credit. Uh, to any firefighter, paramedic, EMT. We added in the first year in 17, they didn't have volunteers. We had to add volunteers in the enabling legislation. And two years ago, we added 911 dispatchers. And then each county could adopt it. Montgomery County did. So I just got $2,500 off my property tax for being an active volunteer, which is huge. Uh, We advocate for the budget in the sense of anything related to fire and rescue, we advocate for, and we get political. The name of your show is politics. The great thing about our association is we're a 501c4. We act very much like a C6, a union. Um, so we're not tax exempt if you make a donation. We don't accept donations, but we are a nonprofit. So we get political, we endorse candidates. We print and hand out at the ballots uh, we call it the helmet ballot, kind of like the teacher's apple ballot. Uh, so we do advocate for candidates. We advocate for policy change and procedure. We advocate for our citizenry. But most importantly, we advocate for all of our personnel for their health, welfare, safety, and benefits. Well, that's really, really interesting. So you guys are going with the theory that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and here the volunteers are advocating for themselves, which I think could be a very powerful thing. Now, your allegiance to the politicians that you're endorsing, I'm sorry, I cut off Dave, he didn't jump in quick. He's got that Southern hospitality. Um, (laughs) So your allegiance to candidates, is it solely based on 
the perspective and through the lens of the fire department, emergency response, EMS, and what that candidate's position is, or is it based on partisan politics? Mm. Good question. Excellent question. It's the answer is it's how they support the fire service. Okay. As a whole. Now it, where we live, it's very unique. This County and the state is very democratic. Uh, have we endorsed non-Democrats? Of course we look at the issue, the person we do in-person interviews. So we've had our governor here in our County association office uh, to be interviewed by our volunteer board to, to discuss issues. And then even if we, do endorse a candidate, they run again, or intra-office time frame, they do policy or take action adverse to the fire service. They feel the pain. So I don't say we're not beholden to anybody. They always are coming to us for the endorsement. And uh, it's not the other way around. But it is nonpartisan. But in this area, it's hard to be nonpartisan. We, we're predominant. We don't have any elected officials it, there's one in the state uh, at the federal level that's a Republican in our county. It's all Democrat. At the state level, it's all Democrat for our county. <clears throat> yeah, I have to, uh, if I may, Frank, um, I have to agree with Eric on that. Because although I say we kind of keep our nose out of politics, I also, like he, uh, would go out during the election season because the union wants us to go out there and, and show a presence. And I would have conversations with guys like uh, Al Hagen, great, great guy good union boss. And I was like, but Al, I don't like any of these guys. He says, well, really? He says, it's about going out and supporting them because they're going to give us in the direct, put us in the direction we want to go, so to speak. You know, not that they're going to give you anything, but if you're campaigning for them, you, you, you've gone a favor down the road. That's what it comes down to. And do I agree with that? Not really, especially in New York, because out of, let's say, 40 or 50 candidates, they'd endorse maybe two Republicans and the rest of all Democrats. But it's New York. What do you expect? Right? Just like what Derek was saying. It's what you expect. Well, we're all from blue states, so we all feel we all feel your pain because Connecticut's as blue as New York and Maryland's becoming now. Uh, yeah, Dave, yeah. you haven't even talked on this show. You've been so quiet. Come on, jump in here. One of the things that I want to tack on uh, to what Eric is saying, and 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 uh, he'll he'll agree, is that um, we've continually, as far as volunteers. With the LOSAP or Length of Service Award Program, it has continually gone up. So the volunteers are getting uh, more of a tax break on their taxes in the state of Maryland. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, it's up to $7,500, correct? Or is it going up even more? I know the goal was to get to 10000 Is that still a thing? We tried to get it this past legislative session. Uh, however, we were penalized. Uh, because the name of our statewide organization is the Maryland State Firemen's Association. We're one yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. the country. You want, you want to talk about politics. You want to talk about politics. That That is a sore subject of what that particular politician did. She held that hostage because they wouldn't change the name of the organization from Firemen's to Firefighters Association. And uh, that is just that's dirty politics to hold something hostage like that. I'm not going to get into it any more than that. I agree, but, but Dave. I agree. It, it, no, I, I don't think anybody, not one person, but it, it, it was clear that it was the right thing to do. And politics is not pejorative. Politics is just relationships. Right. And that um, when you have relationships, there, there are two ways. And, and it's a two-way street. It is a shame that um, our name does not reflect our service. In Montgomery County, we are over 50% female, 50% minority. And much of that is because of the work our association has done through successful application of safer grants. We were the first in the country to get uh, a recruiter for three four-year grants. We're in our fourth four-year grant uh, for a recruiter uh, through safer. And with that, we go into our community and recruit men, women, of all diversity, we speak 23 different languages in the fire service here. So it, we don't, the name of the state organization does not reflect that. And that was a problem. No one person held anything. Did, were we successful in Annapolis? No, we weren't successful because we don't reflect who we represent. So it's a problem. And I, and I, that's going to change. And I think everybody understands that it, it will change. I mean, to me, it's, it's, 
it's, it's not a big deal. One of the other things that, uh, that, um, along with the low sap, um, with the increase in, in the uh, low sap for the taxes, I know that the, in, for people that are watching the show, don't understand that the, the length of service is a statewide program, but it's mandated individually through the county. So it's not dispersed the same, where as much money as Montgomery County gets <clears throat> for their 25 years of service versus Carroll or Cecil or anything like that. One of the other things that Montgomery does is what, what I've been trying to kick this around in, in Frederick County is the moment you hit 25 years of service in Montgomery County, you start collecting. It doesn't matter how old you are. In Prince George's County, it's 55. Now, luckily, I'll be 55 in November, and I'll start to get to collect from Prince George's County with my time there. But uh, some of the other organizations, it's 62, 63 years old uh, before you can even collect, and, and that needs to change. I think there needs to be some stabilization with what the uh, volunteers get. And a lot of people will argue, and like, well, you're volunteering, you're doing it for free. Yeah, yes, we are. We are doing it for free, but, oh, you know, Putting in 25 years of commitment and time away from home, holidays, meals, things like that. Um, it is nice to have that little stipend at the end of, of a thank you. And most of these people are still active beyond that 25 years. Um, but uh, there's there's some normalization that, that has to happen there. Um, the taxpayers are also getting a tremendous benefit for somebody volunteer. They, they are. And, and even though we know that volunteerism is declining, um, we we also have a recruiter in Frederick County and, and she goes out and, and she hits the schools. We just have we have a new high school cadet program that started. Uh, Montgomery's had one for years. I am a product of that, um, that we go out into to the communities and, and Frederick is just as diverse as, as uh, Montgomery County is. It's all in, in the Washington metro area. Um, to try to get volunteers, um, you know, I know we're kind of straying off off of, of this. This is going to kind of transition into some training. But uh, one of the biggest hindrances that we find with keeping volunteers is the amount of training they realize they have to go through just to count as minimum staffing. You're looking at, you know, firefighter one, firefighter two and EMT right there is a year and a half to two years of straight classroom time. Um, Mifri needs to kind of get with the program and they're going to have Mifri as the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute who pretty much govern our classes. My proposal, my thought is we're not going to reduce the amount of hours that it takes to achieve those uh, certs. But what they need to do is get with the times where if I can get a college degree online, there's no reason why the didactic portion of class can't be done on Teams or Zoom. And then you can go in on a Saturday and a Sunday, eight hours, a total of 16 hours per weekend, get the same amount of hours, but get that fire one and two class done quicker with the same amount of hours, with the caveat that you need to go to your volunteer organization and you need to get into the station, get with the members there and start training and applying the training that you've learned in the classroom, start applying that so you can continue to get better. And then when you go in to take your test and you pass, that's the biggest issue that uh, we're finding right now is, is the volunteers, um, once they realize that not only do they have to do hazmat, fire one, fire two, EMT or EMR, um, once that's all done, you're looking at two years. And now you're, you're also talking, I've got a full-time job somewhere else. I've got family at home, but this is something I truly want to do. And what's stopping me is the amount of time that it takes to achieve just that that minimum to be staffing. So, you know, anybody from Mifflin that's listening to this, you guys got to get with the time. A lot of these management classes out there, that can be, you don't have to get in your car and drive all the way across the county to get to your local uh, academy to take a class that for three hours that you can sit online like we're doing right now and have the instructor share PowerPoints and things like that and still get the same thing across. I got most of my degree, my college degree online. Uh, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the smartest in his parents' basement. <laughs> right. I'm not saying I'm the smartest person in the world, but it can be done. So if we can crack that nut, I'm telling you, the people will start to volunteer a lot more the numbers will come up. And I think that you're finding, and Eric, you can back me up on this, um, the career folks are more inclined to have trained, smart volunteers running calls with them as long as they're meeting the same requirements. And it's not, you're taking jobs away from me. We all know that recruiting right now on the career side is is an all-time low. And I'm flabbergasted on, on when we open up 
you know, we're constantly hiring in Frederick and the low numbers that we're getting for people that are that are actually applying for the job. So now is the time where we need to start bolstering the ranks for volunteers while we're trying to bolster the ranks of the career side. So I'm now, Dave, you mentioned early earlier that Tony was involved in, I believe, uh, recruit like uh, high school program or am I correct? Are yes. you teaching EMT in that program so that these kids have a leg up so that they can start volunteering uh, quicker? Because it seems like that would be a good model to give a high school kid in Montgomery County or in Kent where you are that they could actually become an EMT before they even turn 18. Well, uh, becoming an EMT before you turn 18, from what I understand, you can't get your certification. You can become, you can finish the course, but you can't get your certification. But I have kids processing in now. I took this over a few years ago and I had five kids and I, I, it's up to 30 now. And uh, actually 30 is a little too much. I'm through attrition. I'm bringing it down to 20 to see if it's more manageable. Um, but I have, I'm processing so three people in now. By the end of this year, I'll have a total of six people in processing young people, processing into the fire department. And they're going through the motions of when we, when we do our drills, like cadet drills, we always uh, we have fire and we have EMS. Now, some cadets don't want to be firefighters. Some cadets just want to be EMTs. And some cadets really don't want anything to do with EMS, but they want to be firefighters. So we split them up. And I ask, who wants to do EMS tonight? Who wants to do fire tonight? The EMS people go with the EMS, and the fire people come with me. And that's the way we split it up. And we do it regular. And with the 30 people that I have, I'm putting six into the six young people into the fire department this year. I'm putting six more the following year. And then the following year will be seven people should the roster stay the same. On the politics side of it, just so that our listeners are aware of it, in Connecticut, you can get your EMT at 16 with a waiver. So you huh. have to get a, a waiver from uh, OEMS, but with a couple letters of reference, you can actually achieve – your EMT before you turn 18, and then they just don't lead use you as a lead EMT. So right. you can't get hired on an ambulance. And if you were with a volunteer service, you'd have to be with, you know, another EMT. But that's something that, especially now that Montgomery County is getting political, that might be something as a way to kind of, inc- it also helps increase diversity. The, the key to diversity is education, right? So if we can get kids when they're younger and they actually have something that's obtainable, hey, you can get your EMT that's going to help you on your college admissions, other jobs, you become a parent, and here's the fire service and another career venue or a volunteer venue. That might help. So, Eric, that might be something that you guys and girls want to look into. So uh, when I started in Pittsburgh, out in Pennsylvania, you could be an EMT at 16. And I went through class at 15, finished right before my 16th birthday. And in high school, I would drive a private ambulance that I worked for for 340 an hour to high school, park that 1974 Dodge van with the Mars bar and the Motorola siren. Well, I was born in 74. <laughs> my butt, Franklin. <laughs> 340 an hour. And we had quite a few volunteers. Um, Maryland only recently changed it. And we've been going back to the legislature to discuss it because they will absolutely let them train. Um, I don't know what that delta is from people that finish that class and then are ready to be checked off in their 18th birthday. But it, it's a valid point. And I would say that we got a safer grant for our cadet program that we do jointly with Montgomery County government, public schools, MCFRFs, our career side um, at our training academy. And we have over 56 people in our program. We have 80 people waiting for next year. It's a phenomenal program that was only reinstituted because the association got a safer grant six years ago. County had cut it during the Great Recession, um, and it was very short-sighted. So we were able to reinstitute that program back. And we have great partners in county government. So I'm glad to hear that uh, they're doing it down in Kent so successfully. Um, And it's a good point that we need to look across the spectrum how many other states allow EMTs at 16. I don't know when Pennsylvania switched. I moved here in 87. But I'll tell you, I remember my first fire. I remember my first car accident. And boy, I loved driving that ambulance to high school. And then I worked from three o'clock till nine o'clock on that private ambulance, uh, transporting people for 340 an hour. That's what we love the job for. We love the job because of that part of it, right? Going in and helping people. When I came out of the high school cadet class, the high school program in uh, 85, 86, um, we came out as EMTs 
but we weren't allowed to practice. We could ride third on the ambulance, but we weren't allowed to practice. The whole joke was you have to be old enough to be sued. So that was 18 years of age. So um, once we turned 18, we were already uh, um, checked out on the ambulance. We already had our, our EMT certification. We just weren't allowed to use it until uh, you know until we became at the age of 18. Now, we just started our high school cadet program. Well, they call it the work-based <laughs> learning program. It's like a, a, a um, like a tech, like part of the tech department for Frederick County Public Schools. Um, our numbers are down. We're trying desperately to get the numbers in um, uh, for our cadet program. We graduated, I want to say, twelve last year. Um, and the fire chief was was very adamant about you know if you know you guys graduate, you know a true total success story would be, you know, come in as a high school student, take the classes, get your uh, fire one, get your fire two. We give them hazmat. We give them uh, VM, VR, VME and uh, site ops. And then uh, they, we give them EMR because we don't have them long enough to do EMT. So EMR is like the old EMTA program. And then when they, they come out, his, his version of a true success was for those kids to turn 18, apply for Frederick County and become career firefighters. It's a double-edged sword because then we're losing a volunteer. But uh, that's that's the mark of, you know, a success story. And that, that's exactly what I did when I came out of, of high school. I had hired Montgomery County. Um, but we're looking for high school students. Um, we got a little bit behind the eight ball of trying to get into the schools to actually to have career days and things like that because of COVID. Um, so we're hoping that we're going to get some uh, new students. We, uh, myself and, uh, and uh, Chief Shane Darwick, who's the, uh, the director of volunteer services, uh, we've got new helmets for them. We've got new flags for those guys to carry, uh, uniform shirts, things like that. So we're hoping that our cadet program builds up. And, and, uh, and again, you know, I get on my soapbox that we need to do something to clean up these uh, MIFRI classes so we can get some of the older kids or older uh, adults to actually come in and take these classes. And the cool thing about our high school class is we'll allow any volunteer in Frederick County, whether you're in high school or not, to sit in on these classes um, if you had the time. So we, we actually had, you know, 20, 30 year olds taking fire one with the 16 and 17 year olds. Um, but, uh, you know, we're looking for that as well to, to, to try to bolster those ranks. So Davis, um, one yeah. of the things that you talked Davis. about politics real quick, uh, Eric, um, when you talked about how Maryland is a very blue state, I can tell you right now with uh, talking with the union president when when um, uh, Hogan was running the first time, they had interviewed Hogan and the, uh, the guy that was running with him who uh, ultimately didn't win. And um, they secretly backed Hogan, but they couldn't say it and they told they were up front with Hogan saying we'll back you but we can't really say anything right now when he came for his second term because of the things that he did for the fire service and for the state of Maryland uh, the IFF of uh, 1664 said hey we want to be the first union to come out and publicly support you in the state of Maryland and, and they were that he gave Jeff Buttle that that opportunity and they supported Hogan for his second term so even though Maryland is a, is is very blue um you know, there are some shining examples where we can get, you know, a conservative in who actually does good for the state, regardless of how the news wants to spin it. And Hogan did. So I wish he'd have done more. There was more things that we wanted, especially on the career side and on the tax side, you know, for our state taxes uh, for uh, retired firefighters, military and police. But uh, it just didn't get pushed through. But anyway, go ahead, Tony. Dave, excuse me, if I if I may, Dave, two things. Uh, when you came out of cadets, you were able to get your EMT at 16 years old in Maryland? I had my state certification for EMT, but I wasn't allowed to practice until I turned 18. Like I gotcha. said, the joke was you have to be old enough to be sued, and uh, you can't get sued till you're 18 years old. I just want to ask you that because I want to inquire into it. The other thing I, was, I would like to have said to you was, um, oh, what was it about? Back and Hogan. Um, ah, I lost it. I'm getting old. I lose it fast. <laughs> Dave, you want to move this a little bit to training because we have you know two people that are Big advocates of training. Tony's training people around the country. Dave Polikoff's training people around the country. Eric, you're a leader in training because when I lived in the firehouse, you're one of the people that taught me about treating patients with respect, that it's a nine. I remember you even talking to me saying that it may not be a 911 call to us, but it's a 911 call to them. And you only have a couple minutes in that interaction. And it can either be a positive one or it can be really 
a negative one. So you got to be there anyway. So make it a positive one. So you've always been somebody that's advocating for training. And I believe that as president, Rockville gets great training. You have to be advocating for their budget and things of that nature. So I'll let Dave lead the conversation. And Dave, if you want to go to Tony and kind of talk about the importance of uh, training. Yeah, one of the things that I've, that I've admired about Tony, and I'm not saying that just because he's here, it, it, it's true. When I had him on my podcast, Tony had said something to me um, when we first met, uh, and I think we were teaching at West Virginia, maybe, but uh, he had made the comment of, of uh, you know, don't train till you get it right, train till you can't get it wrong. And I've actually lived with that quote that you said, and I'll, I'll give you credit that you made it up, and that's the. I did not make right. it up. I wish I did, but I did. <laughs> And normally the quote goes, amateurs practice until they get it right, professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. And I segue exactly. from there, I segue that everybody in this room, I don't care if you're a career firefighter or a volunteer firefighter, professionalism needs to be the attitude that you have. Because professionalism isn't a paycheck, it's an attitude. And I, I remember we were, when we were, specifically, we were in Delaware, this is when we first met Nick DeVesta, who now works for us as well. Um, we were doing that, uh, some bailout stuff, and, and a couple of guys came up with their Gen Tour setups on their turnout gear, yeah, and Tony yeah, offhandedly yeah. asked the guy, you know how to use that? And, and the guy said, use what? And he said, the setup that you got on there, he goes, no, nah, it just came with the running pants. So then he asked like two more people, they didn't know how to use it. Tony stopped the entire class and taught those guys how to use the equipment that they carried with them on every fire, but they didn't know how to use. That's amazing so, to me that they didn't know how to that, use the gear they're having in there on them. They have it on them. How can you not know how to use it? You can't get to a position and say, there's no timeouts in firefighting. No, wait, wait, how's that go again? Timeout doesn't happen that way. When it's hitting the fan, it's hitting the fan fast and hard, and you have seconds to make a decision. Did they not say on this fire? Last week, where the two Jersey City guys were killed on the ship, the first press conference, the first thing out of the chief's mouth was, we didn't train to fight ship fires. Mm -hmm. I, I just was shocked that even if that's the case, two members have died in the line of duty. And the first thing out of the mouth of the uh, chief is, we don't train to do this. You know something, Eric? When we trained, we trained in New York City, we trained to do ship fires, and we had a, a, I don't know what kind of ship it is. I, I never even owned a boat till I moved to Maryland, but it was a big ship. It was like a battleship or something like that. And the thing that I learned in that week, by the end of that week, I learned a lot in that week. But the thing that stuck out most in my head is I hope I never go to a ship fire. Those things are miserable. It's all grating. The stairs are great. There's nothing holding the heat. The heat is going everywhere. It's black as night, and it all looks the same. It's They are, they are really dangerous fires. And as I said, I was with my company two weeks ago with a, for a reunion. And one of the guys said to me, he says, you know, we haven't trained our ship fire since you, since you were on a job how many years ago. Now, I'm at a job 14 years. So it's over 15 years that nobody's trained on ship fires over there. They need, this is something, again, low, 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 um, low event, high fre uh, high, low frequency, high training. It has to be yeah. that way. And they are scary ships. I'm telling you, that was a scary training exercise. And that's when I came out of it hoping I don't have a fire in the ship. That's how scary that was. Tony, I, in the I, Navy, same thing, boy. Uh, we, we oh, you were a Navy lot. guy, huh? I, I was a Navy guy. Okay. So you had to uh, fight those ship fires. Well, I, I, I thank God he didn't, but we, we had to train for him. You're, you're exactly right. Right. Um, Frank, thanks for the nice shout out. I cannot compare to these two guys when it comes to training. Um, I, I'm, my leadership comes in making sure that the training is available, getting the funding. Uh, number one, making sure it's accessible for us to make sure it's volunteer friendly hours uh, that um, we include everybody. But yeah, it, it, I, I like to hear it that New York is suffering the same thing that we do in a local volunteer fire department, that we don't always train enough. And we never train enough. Never, right. ever, ever train enough. I volunteer on a shift because the guy, Frank, somebody you grew up with, Robert James, you work with him, Dave, RJ. He came here when he was 18 years old, met him the first day he was here. And I was so impressed with this guy's a third of my age. So impressed with him because his whole attitude is train, 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 train. And I've learned more from him riding with him in the last 18 years on Tuesdays than I did in my 30 years prior because this guy's mantra is training. So I make sure he has the money, the resources, the people, the attitude that yes, this is what we're going to do. And, and I'm glad to hear, Chief, that you, you had that problem in New York City too. 
Thank God yeah. we don't have any ships in Montgomery County. Well, one of the kind of guys you need, the guard Jay doing that is what you need at every firehouse, not just fire department, every, every single shift. firehouse. Absolutely. Now, when, when I took over special operations, I was learning the ropes with these guys. I knew the special operations, operations uh, disciplines that I had taken outside of New York City. Then I had to take them again when I became, came to New York City. But when I took over the company, my mantra was drill, drill, drill. In the beginning, when I was rebuilding, it was after 9-11, we're still rebuilding the companies. And... I was taking young men. I'm talking about guys with three years where they don't get on, on into special operation with three years now. But I was looking for an attitude, an aptitude, and a desire. That's what I was looking for in these people. And I would take these guys out. I'd have a roll call at 9 o'clock. I'd say, 1030, we're going out to drill. they clean the whole firehouse. We'd go on the rig. we drill all day till somebody turned around and says, Cap, you're going to let us eat lunch today? And I said, hey, you got to eat too, I guess. You know, so I take them to a pizzeria or a diner. Then we go out and drill some more until maybe about 3, 30, 4 o'clock. And then I go back to the firehouse on the rest of the day is yours. But this also gave me the opportunity to see what they were made of, see if they, they when they spoke with me, if they really had the aptitude and capability that they said they have. And I went through a lot of guys initially, but these guys in that in that uh, company that when I walked out of there, I mean, my, I love these guys. They are the best of the best. They really are. And I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a little impartial to these guys because I train them and I know how good they are. But these guys to this day still train like that. And if I had got stuck upstairs for some reason, I couldn't come down after the roll call right away, they drill themselves. That's the attitude you have to have. And that's what make, makes a good fine. And it's funny, you mentioned, to, uh, Eric, you know, it's the, how New York has some of the same issues that, you know, we have in, 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 in Maryland. And, and it's true. It doesn't matter where you go. You can go to China and they'd have the same issues. They're just speaking a different language. But uh, one of the things, one of the stories that Tony told me, and I'll let him elaborate more, was when they got their uh, uh, personal, their uh, life safety rope. And uh, you guys were allowed <laughs> to have it, but you couldn't train with it. Yeah. So you can go into that story, Tony, because it's kind of hilarious how you got around it. But before so. Tony starts, I want to give a counter view to what Tony's saying for our listeners, because we have a, a wide berth of people that are listening to this, including volunteers and career people. Yes, you want your company officer that's really motivated, but you also got to look at your crew. So if I get a volunteer company that's coming in for a duty night, I don't expect them to be training all night long. I do want them to do one quality drill, critique it, and have dinner together because they're still running calls. When I got promoted in New Haven, I went to one of the more senior shifts and they thought, you know, oh, Frank's a fire engineering guy. This is going to be a nightmare. I didn't drill them to death. What I did was I would do one quality drill a day to get them to buy into training. Training was always fun. I would always go first and then we would critique it. And the company got better, even though it was a great firefighting company. When I became drill master, and this is this is the problem we see across I the like country. that, drill master. Yeah, drill master. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you become the drill master. You can't let good be the enemy. Uh, you can't let perfect be the enemy of good, uh, to quote Voltaire. It's that I didn't have time to do eight hours of training on this and this when you have everything that you could possibly have. So what I started doing with special operations, because they fell under me, is I expected the company officer to train them every day, do something with them. But once a month as a training officer for the city, I would <clears throat> set up a high risk, low frequency drill that would be fun that they could do once. So if a 140 foot tower crane came up in the city, they were doing one evolution, lower them down, critique it. I would do it all, with all four divisions. Um, a barge, confined space rescue, we're doing one evolution, critique it. And then what I found is by doing it Instead of trying to put together a program that wasn't realistic with all the other stuff that we had on our plates, I was building on skills no matter what they did. The stuff they learned in high angle, it was transposing to uh, confined space. They were able to use those same systems to go over to lower somebody off 95 off the bridge or to go get a Yale, that some Yale kid stuck on the, the 300 foot cliff that we have in, in New Haven that overlooks the harbor every year. They don't know how to hike these Yale kids. Um, so they'd have to go and get them. But by doing, by having the training division facilitate one quality drill for each division. So it's four times a month. You're getting people on overtime. You're getting people back. And then they're really buying into it. And then they're taking those skills in a safer environment with their company officer training, just like a trench. They wanted us to use the trench simulator with the concrete walls. They said, no, we'll go to the operating engineers and have them dig us a trench, put a person there and let's get them out. And then everything built. So, so I agree with you. We want people that are so motivated, 
But when somebody's volunteering their time or they're still running calls while they're actively training, you got to find a way to make training fun so it's not punitive. And I've seen so many departments out there, instead of doing one quality thing, they do an eight-hour class. It, they do a week of training, like a place like Newark. They do a week of shift training now. They're going to be doing shift training now. And guess what? Five years from now, they'll be back in the same spot where they're not doing it again. It's- well, I, I understand what you're saying in the volunteer service, but in the career department, <clears throat> first off, you got a captured audience. They can't get away from me. <laughs> but I was also, these are young men, and we have a, a tremendous cache of tools on the squad. And it's, it's a rescue pump, and we have a tremendous cache of tools. So I had a lot of tools to go through. And repetition is what makes you good at what you do. Absolutely. So we go through it, and we, we, we do an hour drill on this an hour drill on this, an hour drill on this. And that's how we went through the day, doing different drills throughout the day. Now, once once we were established and, and, and we were the best squad in the city, um, yeah. then we could drill once once a tour, just going into the, the other uh, squad in the city. <laughs> what squad in the city? I said it's the other squad in the city. They <laughs> oh, is that when my phone's ringing over there? No, <laughs> seriously. Um, once, once these guys were trained and they had their skills set down, then you just, it's a matter of maintenance at this point. And that, that's what we did at that point. But for the first probably six months to a year, we trained all the time. Segwaying back to what Dave was talking about, the bailout ropes. So I cut, they get bailout ropes. This all has to do with Black Sunday, um, of which I, I teach every year. I volunteer my time every year for the Joe DiBernardo Foundation. It's a foundation that actually buys ropes and gives them to departments that don't have ropes. So the same thing doesn't happen like what happened to those guys on Black Sunday, right? Um, we lost uh, Kurt Myron and John Blue and Jim, Jeff Cool, Joe DiBernardo, uh, Stolowski, and um, Brandon all jumped out of those windows. Brandon, being the young strapping man that he is, is in pretty good shape today. Uh, Stolowski shouldn't have even been walking again. He broke his neck, right? Jeff and Joe broke the hips, the femurs, the tip, fit. They, they just busted everything up in a lower part of the body. Joey was given his rights three times. He died seven years later. So that foundation is run by his father, who's one of my deputy chiefs in 19 truck. Awesome chief. Great. He really knew how to run a job good. Um, anyhow, so we're getting the bailout ropes. We go down to the fire academy, and the whole company goes down to rock together. We get trained. They give us some videos. They give us six jumps, and that's it. They send us on our way. I said, what about training? Oh, we're going to come around. They had a modified engine with a back kind of – uh, it, it, it ran like this, and then it would go like this in the back, and it would be a bailout wall that you would go just to get over the slide and slide down a few feet. I called them a couple of times. They never called us. I was like, no, this ain't going to happen. So I had, a, I built, had a tower in there that we used to use for confined space. So we set it up for bailouts. I happened to, let's say, find a blow-up mat right from uh, someplace that the kind that you can jump out into a mat that's going to envelop you. And that's how we set it up, a belay, a mat, and we do this. Every tour for – Easily six months, every single tour, we would do anywhere from five to ten slides. Each individual, five to ten slides, every single tour. If I was working 24 hours, I did it day tour, I did it night tour. Everybody would do it. And now a quick sideball on this. This one friend, one pal, my Billy McMahon, he lives down here also, uh, retired from the job. He says, I said, set up the mat. We're going to do this. No, nah, we don't need the mat cap. I said, set up the mat in the belay. No, nah, we don't need it. I said, Billy, I'm not asking you. Set up the mat. So he goes, he sets everything up. Billy's the first guy out the window. He misses his anchor point, and I got him on the belay. And I'm leaning over going, oh, we don't need the mat cap. We don't need the mat. So what I do is I take him, and I start swinging him on the belay back and forth like this. Now he's going back and forth like a metronome. And I says, okay, guys. I says, you got two minutes. Pelt him with all the rocks you can find. And I just stood there, and they threw rocks, and he's sitting back and forth with his head. And come on, cap. Come on. And that, that was that. All right, so that's just a sidebar. Billy loves it. <laughs> we get called back to the rock a year later after getting our bailout systems, and – they take our bailout systems from us. And I know right there that I'm being called on a carpet. There's no way they're going to not know that my rope, my rope has over 100 slides on it probably. They pull me up in the office and I got a couple of battalion chiefs, captains, lieutenants, and firemen, like a whole line of things. The last, the last supper going on there. And um, it says, you slid your rope. I said, and? Well, we told you not to slide your rope. I says, you also said you would come around and train me. I says, I haven't seen one of you guys yet since last year. And we went back and forth, back and forth. The final result of this was they said to me, if we give you four training ropes, will you stop using your rope? I said, absolutely, but I'm not going to stop training. And that was the end result of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's man presence right there. Stuck up for your guys, took responsibility, and ensured they were trained. I love I would, it. Oh, that happens to be a problem with a lot of leadership today. We're, we're scaring the young people that they're afraid to, to speak up. Like a deputy chief, right? There's no reason I can't go to a deputy chief. Are you a deputy chief, Eric? 
No, no. Okay, well, let's say the deputy chief uh, captain conversation is going to be an Eric and Tony conversation. And I've done this many times. Not once has anybody said, going to be a captain and a chief conversation. I'm like, yeah, Tony, what's the problem? And I could talk to this guy like a regular person now. You know, I can even say, hey, what the heck did you do that for? Right. This is how you converse with people and let them know that they're overstepping their boundaries. The kids are afraid to do this to people today because they'll get stepped on, right? I, I disagree. You have to be able to speak to your supervisors and, and express your displeasure when they have, something happens. I told all my men in my, in my house, if you ever have a problem with something I'm doing or the way I'm doing it, let me know. Don't be afraid to come up and talk to them. Always successful, and guys have let me know. And sometimes it was like, oh, come on, quit being a boss. Or sometimes I was like, wow. Thanks, I didn't realize that. Because nobody's perfect, which was the motto of 19 truck, by the way, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect, and you have to realize, I'm going to make mistakes. Let me know when I make mistakes so I don't keep making the same mistake. Before I go to Dave for a question, just as a word of caution for leadership, if you're the boss, there's nothing wrong with having that, I'm going to take off my badge and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. But you also have to set the expectation as the boss that when the person says, hey, you got to keep it just between me and you, well, if it's about their divorce, then absolutely you're not part of the rumor mill. But there are some things that your personnel have to know that if they tell you, you have an obligation to the values of the organization to report it. So I've seen many people call me up for advice and say, oh, well, somebody said this when it comes to sexual harassment or things like that. There are certain things that you can't have that off the badge conversation with. If it's said, you can't unring the bell. You have to take action as a boss, but you should have the maturity to have that badge off conversation, especially when it comes to criticism. But just set the expectation that there are some things that you can't keep between yourself. That's you exactly right. But it's button. certain things. It's only certain things. It has Correct. to be to a level that it really violates something. I've had guys come up to, to my office and tell me something. I'm like, get out of here. You don't tell the boss things like that. Go down to the kitchen and settle that yourself. Don't. I'm not involved in that. And I kick them out of my office. Get down the kitchen. You solve those problems in the kitchen, guys. That doesn't come to my desk. Here, I'll give you one right off the bat. That's a common mistake company officers make that probably drives Eric crazy as a president of an organization. <laughs> it's when the firefighter comes to you and you're the boss and says, oh, I just tweaked my shoulder, but I don't want to report it. Or I got a little burn on my ear and I don't want to report it. And the officer, and I made this mistake as a boss. I had a, a firefighter that was, he could fight Bigfoot and come out on top. A big strapping six four guy, you know, huge guy, Chris Sikowski. And he goes, Oh, I got a little burn on my on my ankle, but I'm fine. Don't report it. And I fell into the trap as a new lieutenant and I said, Yeah, you'll be fine. I get a call at home on Sunday that he was sent to the hospital because he had a blood infection and it was going up his leg and it turned into a workers' comp nightmare. Wow. Guess what? It fell on me because I ignored it because I said, oh, this guy's so tough. Well, nobody's tougher than a blood infection. So right. you need to tell everybody as a boss and as a training officer that if you report an injury, we're not buddies or friends. You don't want me to know about it. Shut your fucking mouth. But I once agree. you tell me, you're going to Ahmed or I'm at least doing the paperwork. Now, Eric, is that a problem in the volunteers? You need to make sure that people follow the right procedures. Yep. On that same life, right? I get a guy come in. He's, he walks into a roll call like this. That's how he walks into a roll call, bent sideways. So I says to him, Chris, what are you doing? He says, all right, Cap. I says, you can't work like that. No, I'm good. I says, Chris, we're going to go one man down now if you, if you stick around here. I'm good, Cap. I'm good. Okay. I do my roll call. I finish the roll call. I say, upstairs, come on. So I go upstairs and I'm sitting on my desk and he comes upstairs and he comes walking in sideways like that. I says, what are you doing, man? You're hurt. You can't work. No, I'm okay. It's, it's getting better. It's getting better. I says, you're hurt. He starts giving me this. I take the pencil out of, my, out, of my, uh, out of my shirt. I drop it on the floor. I said, pick that up. And he goes, I said, you're going sick. He couldn't even bend over to pick up a pencil. He knew it. He knew. Matter of fact, when I saw him last week, he talked about that too. You can't let a guy work like that because he's hurting everybody. I have a job to do, and I need all of my men to be in their top shape. I can't run one man short. It just isn't the way the SOPs are written. Eric, is your officers making that expectation clear to the men and women that are working with them that if somebody reports an injury, they have to write it up? Yes, I think we're very successful in that. I haven't seen that problem uh, where people are denying injury. Uh, we see a lot. Uh, we just had one guy with a detached retina on the job. We had a, a line of duty death because we had an older volunteer who came in and uh, had a medical emergency. So. I have not experienced that angle. Uh, maybe that's a, a, a unique career volunteer divide that we, we don't suffer from a lack of reporting. 
And you know something with that? Now, this guy, Chris, that I was telling you about, came walking in like this, and I made him go sick. So I go in the kitchen, and I talk to the guys. I said, listen, I know this whole special operations thing. I get it. You don't want to go sick because you're special ops. You're tougher than nails, blah, 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 rah, 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 all of that stuff. I says, it's not how it works. I says, when you get hurt, if you don't report that injury and you don't go on medical leave for it, that injury could be what ends your career. And they're going to say it didn't happen here. Right? You no. got to take them off. You got to write it down and you got to keep it. If that injury is bothering you down the road next year, the year after that, or even six months later, you go sick and take them off it because it's bothering you. Now there's something wrong there. You know there's something wrong there. You can't just let these injuries go by the wayside. I says, if you're hurt, I want you to go sick. I come to work the next set of tours and these four guys went sick. I'm like, come on, guys. That's <laughs> not what I meant. <laughs> I know. I know. Come on. You put a big hole in my chart. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that is so, I know. Like, so typical. I always well, say, he, if anybody can mess anything up, it's a fireman. You put a fireman alone in a room with a bowling ball and anvil and a, uh, a bowling ball and anvil in a mall. When you come back, something's going to be broken. Something's going to be missing. Something's going to be pregnant. It's just the way we are. When I when I was on the truck, we had a new officer come in and said that his he, he didn't care about training. What he cared about is that nobody washed their car until after 12 o'clock. That was like his big thing. And within 15 minutes, every single clock in the firehouse was broken. The 1201. <laughs> I love it. I, know how I they love it. To do it. Just everywhere you walk, the every clock was broken. I'm like, oh, at 1201. 1201. <laughs> Dave, Dave, weigh in. We're almost at the witching hour here. So, you know, a couple of things to to uh, to just wrap it up. You know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, the, the politic, the political part of, you know, with the volunteers and, 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 and you know, the things that we're trying to get, um, you know, Montgomery County is unique with their, uh, you know, with with their collective bargaining rights on the volunteer side. It, it, it's a model that nobody's duplicated yet. And like I said, I know Eric has fielded thousands of phone calls of how do you do it? And, and it's not easy. It didn't happen overnight. Um, and then, uh, you know, where, where Tony brings his his expertise of the, the training and, 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 and how he devoted his career uh, to Kent Island, you know, the, those guys. And, and I know there's a lot of retired firemen on Kent Island um, from, yeah, from all yeah. jurisdictions all up and down the East Coast. Right. They've gained you know quite yeah. a bit in that, in that department to be able to, to, to take that that. Um, mentality of training that, uh, you know, you're never too old to train. And the moment that you're too old to train, it's time to, you know, hang a turnout gear up for, for life. Well, God forbid you hear the words, I know all of that stuff. Right. Exactly. That's the dangerous, that's the most dangerous person out there. And and, yep. and, and again, when it comes to injuries and, and when I was a captain, I told my guys, and as a battalion chief, if you're hurt or if you hurt yourself, I don't care if you scraped your knuckle, I won't send you to the hospital, I'm gonna, but I'm going to do the paperwork. And I back it up with, it's my job. That's my job to do the paperwork. So you're not inconveniencing me because I took this position, you know, as, as either a captain or, or a, a battalion chief or the assistant chief. It's my job to make sure that you're taken care of. So if that means to do 15, 20 minutes worth of paperwork, then that's what it is. But at the end of the day, when you do get that infection and they're talking about cutting your arm off because, you know, you've got an infection, you know, at least it's going to be taken care of and you're not going to have to worry about the bills. Whereas, you know, you had something that happened to you and you let it go. And next thing you know, you've got a severe neck injury and we can't trans, we can't go back in time to when this happened because we never filed the paperwork. You know, and we, Frank gave we the hurt ourselves example. in the time. Frank gave the perfect example. That guy ended up in a hospital because he didn't report it. I, I made that mistake myself. I was on a fire at Picking Avenue at a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and a section of ductwork came down, hit me on the head, knocks me out. Right as the, I'm working on 176 truck, as they're dragging me out, I get up and I'm like, "What are you doing? Well, you got knocked out, boys." I said, "I'm okay. Come on, let's get in it." So we go back and we fight the fire. I don't go sick. I don't do nothing because I'm going on vacation next day. I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and one of the guys says, "I says, hey, Lieutenant, how you doing?" I'm like, "I'm fine." I couldn't shake my head. I couldn't turn my head like that. I can't turn my head all the way to the left now because of that day. Got to report it. Hey, as, as Tom Brennan said, you can never Absolutely. learn enough about a job that could kill you. And if firefighters, and what I always say, if firefighters did what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't need officers. So <laughs> if you want to be an officer, you got to ha take the responsibility for that. Um, mm -hmm. We're at the, the hour mark, so we're going to go around, give everybody their last word, and then Dave and I will sign off for today. Thank you for everybody watching Politics and Tactics. Make sure you check out new fire engineering book, Command Presence, Increase Your Influence. Uh, Dave Polykoff wrote for the book. 
And uh, we're very excited. And you could try the promo code better than Frank Bacuso. I don't know if it'll work, but it might. Um, so <laughs> let's go around the horn. We'll start with Eric. We'll go to Tom. We'll go to Dave. And just so you know, uh, Frank and I share that joke back and forth. So, Dave, go ahead. <laughs> Well, uh, Frank, Dave, thank you for having me here. I've uh, known you both for a very long time. It's a, it's a distinct honor and privilege. I'm so proud of both of you uh, for what you've done in your careers. Thank you for including me and the aspect of the volunteer services uh, and the political side. I, I have argued to I chiefs to NVFC that we need training. I call it the uh, volunteer service and politics, the 800 pound chief in the room. We don't want 800 pound chiefs, but we don't talk politics enough um, and we don't use it. We treat it as pejorative, as a negative, and all it is is relationships. And firefighters may be great at breaking things, but we're also great about building relationships and family, right? We are family. We love each other. Yes, we are. Uh, I bought my house here. I stayed here out of the military because of the relationships I created at the Rockville Volunteer Fire Department and Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service. And this is family. So um, we, we need to take our relationship building to the elected officials that really control ultimately everything that's done in a democracy. And I'm going to close to say that I work with all politicians. Uh, I don't care what party they are in, uh, but I will tell you that I am in a party. And that is another angle that we need to be able to educate and train our members on that just because you may not be in that party, you may live in a majority state where you're not in that party, but you cannot attack somebody or beliefs because of a party. And um, I'm seeing more and more of that right now. I live in a blue state and I'm very blue. I'm a, I'm a proud Democrat and have been. And I, I, I believe that the party cares about people. And not to say that the Republican Party doesn't care about people. I think they do. It's how do you get there? That's all. Very good. Very well Me? said. Go ahead. Um, Morning. I'm going to say, I'll go with, uh, start with where Eric ended. Don't let politics divide your house. Don't let politics divide your company. Okay. Um, like you said, if you can't have a debate, a reasonable debate without getting into hate and calling each other names and starting to yell and cuss at each other, don't have the debate at all. Avoid the subject. You have to stake that family together because you have to work together. You have to rely on each other. Why? Because your life depends on each other. Don't bring politics into the firehouse if you can't do it in a good, mild, gentlemanly way. So, second thing I'm going to leave you with is, as I said earlier, amateurs practice to get it right. Professionals practice so they can't get it wrong. Every single one of you should be acting like a professional. That's what it's really all about. Be professional no matter where you go. And like Frank and uh, Eric had said earlier today, you only get one chance to make a first impression. It should always be a good impression. That's that's all I got to say, guys. David, very well said. And I can't approve on that, Frank, so I'm going to toss it right over to you. <laughs> all right, well, that's it for Politics and Tactics tonight. And remember that firefighters don't rise to expectations like we would all hope and believe. They fall to their level of physical fitness and quality of training. So get out there and train. And that's it. It's another great day in America. Mark, you could take us off.